theory of natural selection marked a pivotal moment in the history of zoological classification. It was simultaneously formulated in the mid-19th century by two English naturalists, Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace. The theory of natural selection is both satisfying and simplistic, individual characteristics within an animal species vary, and these traits are inherited from their parents. If these traits provide an advantage, they are preferentially passed on to future generations. As a result, species gradually acquire new traits and, over a sufficiently long period of evolution, they progressively differentiate into multiple species. The diversity and complexity of life are conditioned by this process. In the decades preceding and following the publication of the theory of natural selection, the most spectacular iconography ever created on the organization of the animal kingdom emerged. Illustrations before the discovery were fascinating but incomplete. Those developed once naturalists grasped the relevance of the new theory were no less impressive. During the first half of the 19th century, accumulating evidence suggested that the Earth was significantly older than suggested by the Bible. This was crucial for naturalists because, given the gradual nature of evolution, its completion required an old planet. Although not the originator of this hypothesis, Scottish geologist Charles Lyell is often regarded as a central figure in reconciling geology with biology. Lyell advocated uniformitarianism, the theory positing that processes and forces that occurred in the distant past continued over extremely long periods to the present day. In his, Principles of Geology, published between 1830 and 1833, Lyell described his work, demonstrating that the vertical stacking of kilometers of sediments and the conical accumulations of scoriae in lava from vast volcanoes could only have formed over immense periods of time, given the unchanging nature of these processes. Darwin carried this book aboard the HMS Beagle, and Lyell's work influenced the young naturalist's ideas on animal evolution. We now know that the Earth is approximately 4.5 billion years old and has hosted life for 80% of this time. However, the question of whether the ancient Earth was analogous to the one known or if it had been constantly disrupted by catastrophes troubled geologists since the 18th century. Evidence of significant climatic fluctuations was brought by Swiss geologist Louis Agassiz's discovery of glaciations in his, Studies on Glaciers, in 1840. Glaciers produce characteristic U-shaped erosions in valleys and mobilize, then deposit erratic blocks in incongruous places. Agassiz hypothesized that glaciers once extended to the Caspian and Mediterranean seas. He embarked on a journey to the United States in 1846 to find evidence for his theory. However, his career took an unexpected turn when he became embroiled in controversies over nature, hybridization, and the origins of human races. He supported the concept of polygenism, arguing that human types constituted different species, a theory that bolstered arguments for slavery. The tradition of creating visual catalogues of animals persisted throughout the 19th century. Exploration of unknown territories and new research methods revealed an ever-increasing diversity to the naturalist artists of this period. Two works stand out prominently from this era. The first is the monumental work by John James Audubon. Published between 1827 and 1838, The Birds of America features 435 watercolor paintings comprehensively portraying these animals with both detail and a sense of fondness. Adding to its significance, Audubon depicted them life-sized, requiring each page to accommodate even an eagle comfortably. The second notable work was by John Gould and Henry Constantine Richter, published from 1845 to 1863, The Mammals of Australia, which brought together for European and American readers the diversity of marsupials and monotremes from the antipodes. Though less extensive than Audubon's opus, this work exhibits high artistic quality and reveals great empathy for the animals. These unique creatures seldom seemed as playful, proud, or timid, the gaze of some appears sad and resigned, 
as if they already knew they would disappear a century and a half later. Between the early and mid-19th century, new observations accumulated at a remarkable pace. In 1823, human and mammoth bones were discovered together in a Welsh cave, suggesting these two species coexisted. In 1844, journalist Robert Chambers anonymously published the controversial work, Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation, discussing the formation of the solar system, the origins of life on Earth, human origins, and how animal species could diversify with increasing complexity. Calculating in 1862 the kinetics of planetary cooling, Lord Kelvin estimated an age between 20 and 100 million years, though these substantial figures did not satisfy some uniformitarians who argued for an infinitely ancient Earth. During this period, embryologists and paleontologists, particularly in France and what is now Germany, developed ambitious frameworks that integrated knowledge of fossil history, the embryonic development of animals, and this new science called evolution. It was within this intellectual ferment that two English naturalists were poised to revolutionize biology. Born in 1809, Charles Darwin quickly redirected his interest from medicine to natural history. During his voyage aboard HMS Beagle from 1831 to 1836, he gained renown as a zoologist. He communicated on the existence of marine fossils found in high sedimentary layers in remote mountainous regions, alongside clearly extinct animal bones next to modern-looking mollusk shells, on the apparent stability of the Earth, on the single origin of all humans, and most significantly, on the subtle variations among finches from the Galapagos Islands. He likely began to conceive his theory of natural selection around 1838 and formulated it in 1844 in an unpublished article. Born in 1823, Alfred Russell Wallace traveled to Brazil from 1848 to 1852, then to what is now Malaysia and Indonesia from 1854 to 1862, collecting and studying thousands of specimens. It was during these explorations that he began to develop his theory of natural selection. In 1855, he described affinity relationships, drawing branches as intertwined as the boughs of a gnarled oak, and began to conceive a genealogical tree of animal species. More a geographer than a zoologist, Wallace had an equal passion for the animal's habitats, ecology, and distribution. Indeed, he became one of the promoters of the field of biogeography as it is known today. Darwin and Wallace each published on their theory in 1858. Encouraged by what he had read in Wallace's early works, Darwin published, On the Origin of Species, on November 24, 1859. Throughout the maturation of their conception of natural selection, the two naturalists encouraged each other, and Darwin often emphasized how much their thoughts converged. They corresponded throughout their lives, while their ideas revolutionized the scientific world. Darwin's notebooks and his Origin present surprisingly modern trees schematizing relationships among animal species, albeit in small numbers. For instance, Origin contains only one drawing, somewhat an arboreal sort. Darwin probably believed this type of representation was already well known enough to establish itself as the preferred illustration of relationships among species. He suggested, however, that a coral might provide a better analogy, as polyps grow at the end of a substrate made of dead ancestors and not of a living branch. In fact, the first modern phylogenetic tree was published a year before Origin, unnoticed, in Heinrich George Braun's Principles of the Development of the Organic World. In some respects, this Teutonic foreshadowing announced the trees of another German, Ernst Haeckel, a fervent supporter of Darwin, who would become the most prolific creator of such trees in history.
Edward Hitchcock personified the struggle between science and religion in the 19th century. As a young devout pastor, he embarked on a career as a geologist and paleontologist, which forced him to confront the contradictions between science and theology. Appointed professor of chemistry and natural history at Amherst College at the age of 32, he also participated in major state geological projects. It became evident to him that the chronology of the Bible fundamentally conflicted with his geological observations. In his effort to reconcile the apparent age of the earth with the Genesis account of a world created a few thousand years ago, he developed his own reinterpretation of religious texts. He concluded that creation could not have occurred in six literal days and that the flood did not explain sediment stratification or fossil deposits. Thus, Hitchcock proposed that the days of creation were instead periods, analogous to what we now recognize as geological eras. Nevertheless, he maintained that God remained the creator of living organisms and the driving force behind their evolution. Although he described changes in species and their extinction in a paleontological framework strongly resembling a tree, Hitchcock refused to accept that these upheavals could have purely terrestrial causes. Similarly, he asserted that humans shared no common ancestor with other animals. The works of Darwin and Wallace ultimately undermined Hitchcock's scientific religious theory in the later years of his life. With the earth unquestionably ancient, it was natural selection that drove changes in its inhabitants, not the hand of God. After the publication of On the Origin of Species, none of Hitchcock's subsequent editions contained the elegant and influential paleontological chart. Before the discovery of natural selection by Darwin and Wallace, biologists extensively pondered the origins of humanity. Most, like modern biologists, already believe that humans shared a common ancestor and were all related. The ability of representatives from various ethnic groups to interbreed and produce healthy, fertile offspring already indicated that humans constituted a single species. However, during a brief period in the mid-19th century, one individual managed to cast doubt on the monogenetic origin of humans. Josiah Knott, a surgeon in Mobile and a staunch advocate of slavery, dominated what was then known as the American School of Ethnology. Social relations in America at that time fueled debates over the existence of human races and their relative superiority more than in Europe, largely due to pervasive slavery and efforts to justify its continuation. Not rejected the idea of evolution and reverted to an animal classification presented as a bestiary more in line with his approach. He was among the most fervent proponents of polygenism, the theory that different human races were separately created entities by God. Disregarding scientific evidence and publications by others, not likened individuals from the union of different ethnic groups to types of mules. He claimed that Genesis only recounted the history of a small group of men descended from a white Caucasian, Adam. Not asserted that everything pointed to the justification for white men to dominate black men, arguing that their natural condition destined them for enslavement. Polygenism faded into obscurity, and with Darwin's theories definitively undermining its credibility, not ceased his work. However, polygenism and racial theories did not completely disappear, unfortunately persisting to some extent even today. Alfred Russell Wallace, the Welsh naturalist and explorer, was one of the two architects, alongside Charles Darwin, of the theory of natural selection. He also integrated animal classifications into geography and history. Unlike Darwin, Wallace lacked the financial security from marriage but managed to finance a more adventurous life. 
Influenced by his discoveries of new lands, he joined an expedition to uncharted regions of the Amazon in the late 1840s and embarked on an eight-year journey through present-day Malaysia and Indonesia, a trip that would shape his career. In a feverish night in 1858, Wallace suddenly realized the concept of species evolving. He promptly wrote to Darwin, with whom he had corresponded for years and shared similar views on the natural world. From then on, it was challenging to distinguish the contributions of the two naturalists to the theory of natural selection. They exchanged extensive correspondence, mutually reinforcing their observations, and both published papers in 1858, a year before the release of Darwin's, On the Origin of Species. Wallace remained a devoted admirer of Darwin and did not resent his own lesser fame. In addition to his pivotal role in the theory of natural selection, which is often underestimated, Wallace founded the science of biogeography, the study of the past and present geographic distribution of animals. He collaborated with the English zoologist Philip Sclater, identifying the six faunal regions still recognized today. He observed the Wallace Line, a virtual boundary he identified himself, which separates the Indo-Malayan and Australasian faunal regions, distinguishing the animal fauna of Borneo and Bali to the west from that of Sulawesi and Lombok to the east. Ernst Haeckel, a professor of zoology at the University of Jena, was a prominent figure in 19th-century zoology. Going beyond Darwin, he developed his own radical version of Darwinism. Originally an artist strongly influenced by German romantics, Haeckel traveled extensively, collecting and painting specimens that would later illustrate his theories on evolution and natural selection. He amassed a veritable menagerie of skeletons and embryos, and his exquisite illustrations adorned art schools throughout Europe. He was notably clear for his time in asserting that humans are just one species among many. His zoological classifications were based on the idea that all life forms descend from a single, simple ancestor. Consequently, his phylogenetic trees all have a single trunk, with humans occupying the crown. Heckel focused extensively on the origin of life and studied the simplest creatures. He made observations on the progressive nature of evolutionary processes and the links between evolution and embryonic development, at a time when embryology was rapidly advancing. He believed that evolution progressed towards perfection, but he is also remembered for extending his theories to human races and religions. It is surprising that the artist who produced such beautiful zoological illustrations also wrote that Judaism was an intermediary between primitive paganism and an evolved Christianity, and that non-Europeans were physiologically closer to mammal types like monkeys or dogs than civilized Europeans, and thus should be assigned a completely different value in life. Although his writings were later partially embraced by Nazi ideology, Heckel's art remains a testament to the grand tradition of 19th-century naturalistic classifications.